Hello fellow chiropractors, slayers of civilization, unleashers of the imprisoned impulse. I am Dr. Anthony Pellegrino from CairoEdge and welcome to your chiropractic research breakdown where each week we break down the most relevant chiropractic science and philosophy to empower you with the armo and certainty necessary to change your community from the inside out. This is a little bit of a special episode for us today because I am listed as an author in one of the papers that we'll be breaking down. We have three articles for you today. One is going to be on adult onset ADHD from the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research. One is going to be on birth trauma. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this in a way that you might not expect me to say. This is from the Journal of Chiropractic Australia. Of, uh, Chiropractic Journal of Australia. And the last one is from the CBP docs who just are in my inbox every day, uh, Dr. Doug Lightstone, Curtis Fedorchuk, Matt McCoy, and Dr. Harrison, um, and that's going to be on telomere length and a bunch of stuff like dysautonomia. It's another case study from the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research. Um, as always, you can get this information straight to your inbox from our website, CairoEdgeMedia.com. We have a free trial for you on there. I just wanted to take a real quick second and invite you guys to join me in August, August 10th to 12th, at the Chiropractic Conference of the year. This is the conference that changed who I was from somebody who really liked chiropractic care to somebody who lived and breathed chiropractic every single moment of every day. And this is going to be the AMPT conference in Atlanta, Georgia, August 10th to 12th, I believe it is. You can check it out, ampednow.com slash event. Please, if you're listening to this, join me there. If you care enough about chiropractic and your community to listen to this podcast, which I hope that you do and I hope you tell your friends about, then you should care enough to be at this conference because you're going to learn the nitty-gritty, the ins and outs on every little detail of running a practice and being able to change the health of not only of your, of change the health of your community and do it in an effective way by correcting subluxation and subluxation only. If you guys go, you might even get to see me. I might be sharing a little bit from stage on the same kind of stuff that we're talking about here today. So anyway, the AMPT Conference, Atlanta, Georgia, AMP 10th to 12th. Check that out, AMPT, A-M-P-E-D, now.com slash event. All right, guys, this article I'm really excited to share with you about is called Resolution of Adult Onset Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, following chiropractic care for management of vertebral subluxations, a case report and review of the literature. Now, it's a long title. It's from the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research. It was published in June of 2018, so last month, if you're listening to this on time in July. Um, and it was actually published by uh, Dr. Eric McNulty, who's in private practice in Peru, and myself, Dr. Anthony Pellegrino, private practice of chiropractic, Seeger, New Jersey. Um, just complete disclaimer with this I'm listed as an article in this paper it was a case from uh, from, from from my office uh, but dr. McNulty did all of the writing 99.9 percent .9 of the writing on this um, actually all of the writing I just kind of had a quick conversation with her but she did such a solid job writing this um, I, I really think that this is if you're gonna read one article this month um, this is gonna be one of the one of the articles you want to read especially if you like taking care of kids especially if you like taking care of kids with neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. Her review, her introduction, her proposed mechanism of subluxation, it's all great and really detailed, and we're going to go over it now, but you know, there's some translation that will be lost to just listening to this in, listening to this in audio format that I think really breaking down and reading the exact words and digesting it is going to be something that's really applicable. Um she talks about, in the introduction, ADHD is one of the most common psychological disorders in children. However, it's not a problem that is typically diagnosed in adults. Um, and that's something that, that's, that's really interesting for this case, which specifically is adult-onset ADHD. Now, she breaks down some of the prevalence, and it's one in five children in the United States have currently, or sorry, in 2010, one in five children in the United States had a mental health disorder. And it's most commonly ADHD. In the United States, it's between 5 to 8% of the populations, um, which is similar to other countries as well. So a lot of times uh, I hear people talk about, oh, it's just the sugar. It's our diet that affects these kids. It causes ADHD. And that's just really not necessarily the case because other countries that have better diets than ours um, don't ha have, have, equal, have equal prevalence. 
Um, boys have a higher rate than girls, but boys are also more common to have things like uh, other comorbidities such as oppositional defiant disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, they mentioned that ADHD symptoms begin to decline with age, but 40 to 70% of children with ADHD will continue to experience that as adults. So when we talk about in our offices that healthy kids become healthy adults, sick kids become sick adults, there it is right there. So 3 to 6% of the adult population right now suffers from ADHD. Adolescents and young adults with ADHD are at higher risk of academic failure, poor relationships, and emotional troubles. Risk factors for persistence into adulthood include familial and psychiatric comorbidity. If left untreated, adults with ADHD tend to have higher work instability, higher rates of incarceration, lower socioeconomic status, higher rates of divorce, and more numerous difficulties at work. When 172 adults were compared with, uh, with ADHD with non-ADHD, those with ADHD reported more frequent changes in jobs as well as more speeding violations. So this is just, you know, an issue that it can seemingly be almost sometimes something that we laugh at or ignore or we're told that it's a made-up issue or whatever it is. But the fact is, is that children who function this way adults that function this way have numerous changes in their quality of life outside of oh hey it's difficult for me in in school um genetic testing and commonalities found that um in in uh, include the recognition of the dat gene which controls emotional processing and changes in dopamine receptors D4 and D2 in correlation to the disorder. Now, one of the reasons that that's really important is that torque release technique, which is the technique that's used in this case study, um, Dr. Jay Holder often talks about the brain reward cascade and reward deficiency syndrome and how individuals uh, or how this can help with upregulation of that D2 dopamine receptor and individuals who have Um, excuse me, have insufficiencies with that receptor are more likely to experience this reward deficiency syndrome, which is basically an interruption of the brain reward cascade, which is the cascade for um, the the neurological, neurochemical cascade in the brain that is basically responsible for happiness and reward, right? So you can think back to dogs and Pavlov's dog, right? And it's like, uh, we ring the bell and they get the food and then eventually you ring the bell and and they don't get the food but they're still salivating essentially um and that would be that cascade of that reward right with associating different things with rewards now in individuals who aren't as easily able to have this dopamine cascade essentially this brain reward cascade and i'm dumbing this down for audio format um obviously you can go really 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 deep in here but individuals who aren't as able to have this um uptake of dopamine via the brain reward cascade are going to be more likely to participate in behaviors that will release higher, that will release this cascade more, um, like addictive behavior, sex, gambling, drugs, etc. Okay. And that's a huge premise in the research that Dr. J did, um, on torque release, te- release technique and addiction. So, Management of ADHD includes medi- medication, education, creating daily structure, increasing self-esteem, forming support systems. Low self-esteem and confidence are common consequences of ADHD, so it is important to challenge negative self-talk and set attainable goals that are clear, short-term, and provide a sense of accomplishment. Now, that little tidbit right there for you for to use in your practice when you're working with kids with ADHD, make sure that you're speaking life into these kids. It's easy when they're come running around the office to get frustrated, for their parents to be frustrated. Sometimes we have to deal with that as well and just saying hey this is going to be a place of positivity for them right we see kids here if they destroy something whatever right i mean run your office how you want to run your office but the fact is we have to be creating positive environments for these kids um patient who present with uh with symptoms of adhd have comorbidities such as tick disorders learning disabilities uh tourette's substance abuse disorders children have higher rate of 
have higher rate of tick disorders. Adolescent ADHD patients are at risk for cigarette smoking and substance abuse. 19 to 30%, uh, 37% of those with ADHD have other mood disorders, such as bipolar disorder and depression. 10 to 28% of personality disorders. Uh, major depression is considered as a subtype of ADHD. Anxiety disorders are prevalent in about 25 to 50% of patients. And there are addictive problems in 32 to 53% of ADHD patients. What I'm saying saying with this is that medication isn't necessarily working, right? When you have somewhere from a quarter to a half of individuals with a diagnosis being addicted to something, we need to we need to take a different stand, right? We need to do things that are going to be natural and positive and drug less in helping these kids, helping these adults function as well as they possibly can. So here's the case study: thirty eight year old male. Presented to a chiropractic office with a complaint of adult-onset ADHD. Uh, He also complained of low back pain, along with numbness in his lumbar region spine and left sciatica. The The low back pain incapacitated the patient's ability to walk and concentrate due to the severity of pain. He also complained of constant headaches, for which he was taking a leave daily. They were described as excruciating and and constant and interfering with daily activities. The patient had been on several different medications to control his ADHD for the past 13 years. So that is saying from the age of 25 to 38, this man was heavily medicated. With what, may you ask? Well, in order to control this, he had been taking Adderall, Oxycontin, and Lortab to manage the symptoms of ADHD and others since the time of diagnosis. He also was diagnosed with migraine headaches. (sighs) He also had a history of addiction as well, and he was taking Adderall, Oxys, and Lortab. So 38 years old, can't focus, constant pain, migraines, drugged up, finds a chiropractic office, ends up there, start talking about the things like low back pain, and then begin to educate on the true power of chiropractic care, which is allowing the brain and the body to communicate more properly, communicate better, and oftentimes many of the symptoms that we experience to improve, but overall quality of life does. This patient was cared for for two months with torque release technique, three times a week for four weeks, and based on the patient's improvement, two times a week for four weeks. So after 13 years of Adderall, Oxys, and Lortab, after 13 years, two months of care, the patient stated that he had an 80% improvement in his symptoms within a month of beginning chiropractic treatment. After a week of treatment, the patient's medical doctor who was managing the the patient's ADHD decreased the patient's medication dosage. Within two months, the patient was no longer taking any medications for ADHD, including the Adderall, Oxycontin, or Lortab. The patient stated stated that he could focus more and felt more energized, and the secondary complaint of low back pain had resolved after two months. After 13 years of this, 13 years of living their life this way, two months of care, complete resolution, just about 80%. The fact is, is that there's no ADHD adjustment. We know that, right? There's no ADHD adjustment. But the fact is, is that inter- interference in the nervous system specifically, and I want to go in through her mechanisms of subluxation here because it's absolutely beautiful, talking about how in the vertebral column is highly innervated nature and relating structures. Any misalignment there is going to cause nervous system stimulation, specifically mechanoreceptors, right, sensing joint position, and nociceptive receptors, which are what sense the changes that send messages up to the brain that interpret pain are also found in the facet joint tapples, capsules. Therefore, atypical joint motion, aka subluxation, will disrupt proprioception and pain perception. They're also found in the me- mechanoreceptors are also found in the discs and the ligaments of the spine. These mu- these receptors send messages up the spinal cerebral cerebellar tract, which in inter- which uh, desiccate and um, send messages to the cerebellum and the midbrain and the prefrontal cortex. Alteration of these receptors are found to have postural deficits since the disc and mechanoreceptors regulate the proprioception. So obviously, if proprioception or joint position sense is being transmitted to the brain and is being transmitted aberrantly, 
uh, postural responses to that are going to be improper. Disruption of this afferent input, afferent meaning from the body going up to the brain, disrupts the efferent, for which means from the brain going down, response and produces overstimulation. Now that overstimulation results in hyperactivity due to the signaling in the cortex, and it can manifest as spastic muscles, abnormal posture, sensory integration disorders, and many other disorders of the nervous system. In the prefrontal cortex, executive function controls mood, activity, concentration, attention, decision-making, and memory. Basically, when you look at all this together, we're looking at how, if you were to just literally look at Guyton's textbook of physiology and trace any of the subluxation or misalignments of the spine and trace where they go in the brain, you can look at how each of these things can really contribute to many of the symptoms that we classically know as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Woo! Does that get you excited or what? Literally just go to go open up the nervous system section. There's three chapters. I think it's three. There's a whole section in Guyton's textbook of physiology, and you can literally look at what I consider to be the best book for learning about what subluxation does because you just trace it. Look at the mechanoreceptors in the spine. It talks about how they're in the cervical spine. It talks about what's there. Look at, trace where those nerves go up. Trace the afferent, path, the afferent pathways. Trace the efferent pathways. You can see how why it's so important to t- check kids. Not just the ADHD, not just with autism, not just with other neurovel- neurodevelopmental disorders, but for everyone because it's going to affect everything from posture to mood to executive function to cognitive function to thinking to sleep to our immune system via the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access to every single thing that we as adults and we as children will do on a daily basis that we don't think about. Anyway, I absolutely love this. Go check this out. This is June 2018, the uh, resolution of adult onset attention deficit hyperactivity disorder following chiropractic care for management of vertebral subluxations, a case report and review of literature by Dr. Anthony Pellegrino and Dr. Aaron McNulty um, in the Annals of Vertebral Subluxation. All right, the next thing we're going to be talking about here today is going to be birth trauma, one of my favorite topics. And this is from the Chiropractic Journal of Australia, and it's called Instrument Assisted Delivery and the Prevalence of Reduced Cervical Spine Range of Motion in Infants. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to my commentary on this because I don't want you to take what I say the wrong way, and I don't want to see anybody take incorrect information from me and go run out to justify anything. Because what I'm going to say here is probably going to be different from what you would expect to hear. So please pay close attention. In this study uh, in Australia, they talk about um, how the evidence of in adults suggests that altering normal cervical spine motion, there is an in, with an in, altering a normal cervical spine motion, there is an associated risk, uh, increased risk of alterations in autonomic function, increased nociception, or I mean, that's just called pain cause pain and cortical disaffrontation, but this information is lacking for the infant population. However, afferent systems and cortical perceptions of pain are well developed by 30 weeks gestation, as are the autonomic nervous system and vagal tone. Cortical effects of an altered cervical spine motion in infants is yet to be researched. Basically what they're saying is, although we don't have the research on this topic yet, the effects of misalignment subluxation of the spine and what it actually causes in terms of autonomic regulation, it just makes sense based on what we see in adults and how we can translate that to children. It's a little bit harder to study in children. So what they say is that research research has indicated there is a threefold increased risk of birth trauma with forceps forceps assisted delivery and a fourfold with vacuum assisted delivery. Furthermore, the process of birthing places high amounts of force through the cervical spine with up to 120 newtons of compressive force reported for vaginal delivery and over 200 newtons for assisted delivery. Now, because most of the people reading this are not physics majors or they live in the U.S., 120 newtons, which is for vaginal delivery of compressive force, is about 27 pounds, and 200 newtons for assisted delivery is about 45 pounds. So what they did in order to study this and look at the effects of birth trauma on cervical range of motion. And then from there, obviously, if there's a decreased cervical range of motion, what we can do is we can deduce um, what the neurological changes of that would be. So they just want to look at cervical range of motion from the of the spine coming from birth. Um, what they did was they studied in a chiropractic children's only clinic in Australia. They looked at 176 consecutive infants um, and they just looked at their cervical ranges of motion, looking for change, looking for decrease. And then what they did was they broke them up into one, two, three, four, five categories. All right. The initial two subcategories are cesarean section or vaginal birth. Okay. So all children are born via C section are put into one group and vaginal birth was 
broken up into another group, while vaginal group was broken up into four subgroups. Vaginal, vaginal birth with zero intervention, okay? Vaginal birth with forceps intervention, vaginal birth with vacuum intervention, and vaginal birth with vacuum and forceps intervention. So what they were expecting to see is that the more um, intervention that was present, the more decrease of cervical range of motion. What they found of these 176 births that were that 125 births were vaginal and 51 cases were C-section, which is about 28% C-section, which is very close to what we have in the U.S., which is about 33%. Um, and there were 55% of all of these births had decreased range of motion. I'm going to talk about why that's important. Um, anyway, uh, what they found was that there were significant decreases of range of motion in every category. However, there was no statistical significantly there was no statistically significant difference between each category. Now I'm going to go ahead and say and tell you what that means because a lot of chiropractors don't really understand how research works and sometimes I, when I read these papers I hear people make conclusions. So for the rest of the time in the paper what they say is that let's say let's go look at this. So for children who were born via vacuum assistance it says 90 88.9% .9 of these births had decreased range of motion and if they did vacuum and forceps it was 100% of cases. Okay? While every other group C-section was 82%, um the vag uh, vaginal was 76, the other one was 75. So here's the deal. Yes, you can look at the numbers and you can say yes, well 100% vacuum with forceps, right? 100% or vacuum on its own, or sorry, 88% vacuum on its own, reduced range of motion. But here, here's what I'm going to tell you about research. If it's not statistically significant, it doesn't mean anything, okay? So you can go for the rest of this paper, as they do and mention every time, that they can see that there is a higher prevalence, a higher rate of decreased range of motion in children who are born via vacuum and forceps and via for vacuum alone. But because it's not statistically significant, it absolutely means nothing. It might as well mean that they have no change because it can it doesn't it can't prove anything. Statistical significance is saying is what is the probability that these results are actually accurate and not just based off of just freak accident just just freak accident. So the smaller the sample size, obviously the more compelling, the higher that percentages has to be in order to, excuse me, the higher that percentage has to be in order to, you know, be statistically significant. So if you have, you know, 50,000 babies that you're looking at, yeah, sure, maybe a 2% difference is going to be statistically significant because you looked at so many babies, so you can pretty well say there's a 2% difference in cervical range of motion. But when you're looking at 176 babies, you need to be compelling difference in order to see. And it's just not there. So it's not statistically significant. So it doesn't mean anything. So we can shut up about it, right? We can keep talking about the fact that there's differences between vacuum and forceps and vacuum and how this is decreases range of motion, but it doesn't mean anything. So we should just stop talking about it. Because here's the thing, I think that we missed the point on this because, and the reason I'm kind of going off on this is that four, three other times throughout the paper, they mentioned that there's higher, there's higher rates with, of decreased cervical range of motion, which can mean disadvantation, which can mean with this, which can mean that, right? And then they say, oh, but also it's not statistically significant. So you're going to have some chiropractors who read this and say, and go on a pulpit and say, vacuum, vacuum extraction and vacuum extraction with forceps are, 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 are going to destroy baby's neck. Because that's what the number itself says, but it's not significant, doesn't actually mean anything, and any person with a brain who knows how to research is going to be able to just completely slam that and take it off the table. But here's the point that we're missing. 55% of all births, of every single birth, vaginal, no intervention, all the way through cesarean section, 55% of births had reduced cervical range of motion. 55%. Sure. It's not the 80% is subluxation from the Gutman research, which is German. I've never personally read it. I don't use that to justify anything that I say because I've never personally read it and many things get lost in translation as they will with this paper. Um, but 55% had decreased cervical range of motion in any type of birth. So when you go out there, right, it's easy to say, oh, if there was forceps, if there was vacuum, if there was cesarean section, it's easy to be scary with that, right, for other reasons because, yes, there's other types of birth trauma besides cervical range of motion. But the fact is, is that we can see significant change in more than half of babies born via any level of intervention 
if they're born in a field, right? If they're on like the farm with Ina May, there's probably still going to be a need for a chiropractor to get this child checked for interference in the nerve system coming from these misalignments of the spine. It doesn't matter. 55% of cases. No, what they also don't separate is, you know, no intervention can still mean manual traction as well. They don't take no intervention. They say, you know, baby gave birth at home. There was no tugging versus baby gave birth in a hospital and, you know, somebody was wrenching on their neck. They just didn't use forceps. They didn't break that up either. So this is really want to get what I want to get the point of with this. The fact is, guys, is that, yes, it's not statistically significant. It doesn't really mean anything, the paper itself. But let's stop getting so hung up on birth trauma from these increased interventions, right? It's our job to educate, yes. It is our job to educate on the potential effects and let parents know what can happen. But even more so than our job in scaring parents into giving birth at home, and even more so than our job in scaring parents to do specific things, it's to let them know that in any case, for any reason, at any time, every child, every man, every woman should be checked for interference in the nervous system caused by the misalignment of the spine, which we call vertebral subluxation, because it's there in so many cases and will impact every aspect of every moment of that child's life. And the research does support that every man, every woman, and every child should get checked. It just does. So we need to stop getting hung up on these things, on on, the, on this tr- birth trauma, on... Everything like this. Now, I do freak out about C-sections for other research. If you check out other research breakdowns, I'm specifically research out of Denmark that shows that children, because of birth trauma, born via C-section, have higher rates of allergies, asthma, other autoimmune disorders, etc. So we can harp up on that. Um, And if you guys have questions about that, shoot me an email to team at chiroedgemedia.com. But guys, the fact is here is that it's just, it's just, just get the kids flipping checked, right? Chiropractic Journal of Australia instrument-assisted delivery and the prevalence of reduced cervical spine range of motion in infants. This is an article that I'm going to be harping on too highly um, for too long, uh, just because it's not statistically significant, although I think that if we did increase that sample size, we could get more positive information from that. Um, But yeah, for the time being, that's what we have for that. All right, this last study I want to go over with you guys is for another one from Annals of Vertebral Subluxation Research from June 2018. It's called Increased Telomere Length and Improvements in Dysautonomia, Quality of Life, Neck and Back Pain Following Correction of Sagittal Cervical Alignment Using Chiropractic Biophysics Technique, a case study. This is another paper from the doctors, Corridus Fedorchek, Dr. Doug Lightstone, Dr. Matt McCoy, and Dr. D.E. Harrison. You guys are driving me, are going to exhaust me. I can't keep up with you. If Dr. Dr. Curtis Fedorchuk and Dr. Doug Lightstone, if you guys publish another paper, I'm just going to make this whole podcast called the Curtis Fedorchuk and Doug Lightstone Chiropractic Research Breakdown because I feel like every two weeks I've got a paper or more of yours and your recent obsession with telomeres, let me tell you, has got me excited. So I have no idea if you listen to this, but thanks, guys. This is awesome. Human telomere length, telomere length is affected by genetic and environmental, environmental factors. It's longest at birth and decreases with advancing age. As such, telomere length is considered to be a, bio, a biomarker of biological aging. So you're born with them at their longest Throughout, as you age, they decrease size. Anything that would increase size would seem as though it was, a, if it were not only slowing down the process of aging, it could also be like reversing some of the biological markers, biological effects of aging. A 35 year old white female elementary school teacher presented to an office with the primary complaint of neck and mid back pain. For five years following a head-on motor vehicle collision, as well as nocturnal polyuria, whereas she would need to wake up to urinate three to four times per night, the patient reported that she took generic or regular strength ibuprofen at bottle-recommended dosages two to three times per day following the motor vehicle crash, which was five years earlier. She had not and did not take any other medication. She had sustained three prior motor vehicle collisions in which she was rendered, and she drank three to five Mountain Dew sodas per day. 
First, I thought that was silly for them to list. And then as I read through, it made more sense. The patient was seen for 36 visits over five months with CBP. The results over those five months, the patient stated that she had maintained her lifestyle throughout chiropractic care. Just, just wait. After the 36 visits, the patient was reassessed. Her neck and her back pain were reduced. Um, her blood was drawn again, and her telomere value increased by 8%, meaning that she was not only slowing down, but reversing some of the biological effects of aging. She reported she was able to be virtually pain-free after five months after suffering with this for five years and had been able to sleep through the night without having to go to the bathroom to urinate. Now, one of my favorite parts about this is right in the discussion, they hit it up right away, is that most notable is the fact that she continued to drink three to five Mountain Day sodas per day and still yielded the extraordinary health improvements documented because chiropractic is chiropractic and anything that isn't chiropractic isn't chiropractic. Now... I'm going to go ahead and say that again. Chiropractic is chiropractic, and anything that isn't chiropractic isn't chiropractic. So these guys did chiropractic care, right? The fact is, if you look at other research in chiropractic, you'll find that individuals whose nervous system functions better by correcting and reducing the vertebral subluxation are able to make better health choices. In this case, over the five months, she didn't even do that. And she still significantly improved, and while chugging down Mountain Dew sodas, was able to actually reduce the biological markers of aging. Because here's the thing, guys, we can go, we can do colon blow, we can take whatever pills, we can do whatever it is that we want, but the fact is that the number one thing that we have to offer the world, the one thing that we can do that right now no one else can do is reduce vertebral subluxation. And that is enough. Look at the study, that is enough. Now, they're gonna do other things in the study with CBP, like traction, exercises, things that I don't, that are specific to improving um, spinal posture. I don't know that much about CBP other than what I read in research. And that's not necessarily something that I do in my office because the technique that I use is torque release technique, which is just a little bit different. It's a tonal model. But the fact is, is that everything they do is based off of changing and correcting their definition of what a subluxation is, right? CBP looks more at a global subluxation, which is the reason they incorporate those things. But here's the thing, guys. Do subluxation, and it's enough. Reversing biological chemical markers of aging, even though she continued to drink her Mountain Dew sodas. Chiropractic is chiropractic. Anything that isn't chiropractic is not chiropractic. So make sure, I say the only, but at least the number one thing, don't allow confusion around the fact that reducing subluxation is what is going to change someone's life. If you walk out there, you ask any person out there, hey, what do you have to do to be healthy? Is eating, is, is eating healthy important to being healthy? Their answer is going to be yes. Is exercising important to be healthy? Their answer is going to be yes. They might not... They might be able to use some guidance by some people who, right? They might be able to use some guidance as to discovering what actually eating healthy and what exercising actually is, right? But if you go off to a random person and say, is chiropractic care necessary to be healthy? Their answer probably is not going to be yes. So why waste our time? Because you can give undergrad, you can give nutritional advice with an undergraduate degree. You can't adjust subluxation. You can be a personal trainer with a personal training certificate. You can't give chiropractic adjustments specifically and scientifically. So why are you wasting your time? Just find the subluxation, accept it where it is, adjust it, leave it alone. That's all I got for you guys today. Three really, really, really great articles today. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you next week for the Chiropractic Research Breakdown. All right, that concludes this week's episode of the Chiropractic Research Breakdown. Hope you guys all got some quality value from this. If you did get any value, if you learned anything, please subscribe, rate, review on iTunes or whatever podcast of your choice. Please share this with your friends. It's our mission to deliver high-quality, neurologically-based, principled, philosophically-based, whatever you want to call it, chiropractic research to our fellow colleagues so that they can utilize that to not only deliver the highest quality of subluxation oriented care in their office, but to educate their community. Because let's be real guys, a community free from subluxation is one that is thriving, not just surviving, but is thriving. If you guys want some more information and want some detailed, if you guys want some social media posts about this information branded to your office, 
um, as well as patient-specific newsletters, taking the information that I just put, that this podcast is specific for doctors, putting that into patient-digestible information for education to stimulate referrals as well as the proper questions as well as helping with table talk. You guys can always go ahead and get a free trial of that on our website, CairoEdgeMedia.com. We'll be back here next week with some more quality information for you guys. Thank you so much. And once again, I hope that you guys join me in August in Atlanta, Georgia for the AMPT conference where I'll be sharing with you guys uh, from the stage about some really high quality chiropractic research uh, in my talk titled Geeking Out on Chiropractic. That's going to be August 10th to 12th in Atlanta, Georgia. That's going to be directed, the talk is going to be specific to, and the whole conference is specific to, not necessarily for doctors, but for teams, family members, spouses as well, just getting amped up and geeked out about chiropractic care. You can register for that free event uh, for students. There is a charge for doctors and teams, I think, but that event is, you can register for that at ampednow.com event, and I hope to see you there.